All right, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll move around the room a little bit with this session here. So um, what we're going to talk about, um, the first part is uh, dynamic Bayesian networks and then object-oriented Bayesian networks. Now, I usually have like an hour and 45 minutes for this, but I've probably got an hour and a half or something now, which is cool. There's usually a bit too much time for this section anyway, so. And because it's not 100% of a fuss for you. Recall yesterday when I was doing my little like how do we define a Bayesian network and we had like a net the Bayesian network has the variables, the arcs and the conditional probability tables and we had that last little thing that um, Bayesian networks have to be directed acyclic graphs. So everybody knows what that means, right? So it's, it can't have cycles which are um, directed. It can have loops, like two pathways going to the same node, but it can't have a feedback loop through it. However, we've got some real-world situations, which we I think we came up with a couple yesterday, where we do actually know that there's feedback loops in the um, system. So, for example, this one here that we talked about, which was the feedback relationship between socioeconomic status and education. But Bayesian networks don't let us to do this type of stuff, so what are we going to do? Well, this is a pretty straightforward and obvious way to deal with this. What we just do is we make a copy of those variables for each of the temporal time steps here. So this might be generations or something like that, and we have a socioeconomic for the first generation, second generation, third generation, um, et cetera, going on. And that's all feeding between this um, education stuff. So this is something that's a fairly common um, enough um, function that the tools actually have a special support for this. So I'm going to do some demonstrations. I think the next slide was a demo. No, it's not. Um, what we do, so this is in the Netica um, DBN is I'll create a, a network with these two nodes here for socioeconomic status and education. I create the two links between it and Netica, I can't remember if it does complain straight away, first away, but it'll tell you that there's a link if you, a feedback loop if you try to compile it at least. But before we compile it, what I can do, can, I don't know if you can actually see this properly, but you grab one of those and specify it as a delay link and you put a temporal delay on it. So um, can you see this one here that's kind of red? Yeah. Then what we do is we go to the network thing, we go to expand time and we tell it how many times we want to roll it out into the future. Which in this case here was what five times or something like that, five slices. So I'm going to demo that in Netica just to show you. Uh, I feel like I've got an IV drip that I've got to carry around the room with me. Okay, so you have this, um, this BN in your example folders. I don't think it's worthwhile playing with it. We'll get you to open up stuff later on. Um, well, after I've built it, I, I right click on this. And there's an um, option here to specify the delay on that link there. Now, I can put that as um, any number. I, usually, we put that as a, um, a number of one which means that it's going to skip one time slice, but we might want to skip it over two slice, time slices or three or whatever. That's open for that. Then we've got the network, expand time. So I might have that as 10. Then it has this burn in time, which basically um, sets up the priors. So it kind of lets it, runs a model for a few sort of time slices and then um, gets an initial distribution for that. That defaults as two, you can't read that. And then we get this monster here. <laughs> and I can scroll across and we can see that. Anyway, and the, the, the thing that's handy here is this is going to be, this, this is the same network copied multiple times. So we, if we, we could actually construct it like this, but then if we wanted to make a modification, we're going to have to make a modification for all the different nodes along the way. But by having that sort of one time slice thing, then we can actually manage the BN a lot better that way. Um, now the fever problem. This is something that was introduced yesterday in the decision networks there. If you recall, we had this structure that Stephen demonstrated. That was right, wasn't it? I'm pretty certain it was in the decision network. Where we had this, um, this idea of like, you know, we had this fever situation which was, might be caused by a flu and it might show up by a thermometer reading here. And what we're interested in is taking some action here which is going to change our future state of fever. So Stephen wouldn't have pointed out at the time, but you have this kind of thing going on here where you've got fever at one time slice and fever at the next time slice. So we've actually got the starting of a dynamic Bayesian network here. Um, so we can specify that 
in such a way where we have our, our initial time step and our future time step and the relationship between that. So um, aspirin is, the aspirin that we take now is going to potentially affect whether we're going to have a reaction in the future or we're going to have a fever in the future. Um, whether we've got a flu has a, some uh, inertia over time. So it, we might, we, there's a chance that flu might become into existence or it might go away. Our fevers seem to be related over time as well. And our thermometer reading is going to just be dependent on the fever. So the, fever, the thermometer reading we get each time step is just going to be dependent on whether we've got the fever at that particular time step there. Um, so in here we have a few, some of the sort of uh, terminology is we have, uh, we have eight, one node for each variable for each of the time sl steps there. We have the different types of um, time slices, which are the interest um, slices. So that's the links within a time slice. So that would be flu to fever, fever to thermometer, and we've got the inter um, slices. If you're writing papers on Bayesian networks, I suppose this, on dynamic Bayesian networks, this is useful, but I don't really even think about this in these types of terms here. Anne Nicholson did her PhD on dynamic Bayesian networks, so she's particularly, if you're keen on this, then she can talk to her about it. So we've got inter time slices, which is like over from flu time one going to flu times times one plus t plus one. Um, now I've, I've, I actually do a fair amount of these types of models with um, my work, um, including I did one for uh, the Western Grassland Reserves on um, management of how we can restore grasslands with um, different interventions on burning or grazing or whatever. And the way that I was using it was having the, the grassland state um, transitioning over time and it would be affected by whatever intervention we're doing over that season. So we'd have this time slice going over time. And I was breaking all the different grass species into something like about 16 different subgroups and creating this massive network, rolling it over time, 20 years, four seasons every year. And you create this really massive network quite easily. I've got the tools that will just help me generate this network. And it becomes really, really big. And you also have this problem where you've got a lot of multiple connections going through there and the tools tend to sort of break down when we start doing these really big Bayesian networks. So we have a few different tricks that we have there. Um, we're using these two time slices over time. So what we'll do is we'll calculate this transition and then take the output of that and then put it into the next time slice. There's a few little tricks that we do with um, dynamic Bayesian networks that is worthwhile knowing about. But there are some issues with this. A lot of the tools aren't particularly good at dealing with really big Bayesian networks. I think for this project, Eric, Stephen, the, the networks that these guys are going to be creating aren't going to be too large. They're probably like in the 20 node type size max, right? Okay, so we don't have that much problem with that. But in the future when you start doing more, you'll just totally become pioneers in um, Bayesian networks and you might come back to this and realise that stuff. Um, so we can do that with um, a decision networks as well, so we can create a decision plan over time. In our fever type network, it could be we decide on how often we're going to take aspirins just in case we might actually develop a fever in the future or something like that. In my grassland type thing, what I'd do is I'd project my model into the future and test out, test out different sort of management scenarios. So burning every autumn, doing a, um, a graze every um, spring or something like that to see how the model would project into the future and we make a decision plan over time. Uh, so with the CVD, we might do that as well. Um, now, uh, DBN support is kind of in most of the tools. Um, it's, uh, um, Juni's got a good sort of support for it, which we'll do an ex um, example on that. Um, a Bayesia Lab, Hugen, and a GenaRisk. Do we have a, does a GenaRisk incorporating dynamic Bayesian networks? Right, okay, it might, it might not. <laughs> um, now, Genie's um, dynamic Bayesian interface is quite nice. Um, so the way we might do this is we create this thing called a temporal plate, and in our temporal plate we put our, um, our two variables here. So we've got SES and education. This one here with the one on it is our delay link. So we're going to have a temporal delay of one pointing into the future. I'll run this, and this is rolled out three time steps. And the way it does it, it shows how that probability distribution is changing over time, which is quite a neat way to present how things are changing over time. So we start off with our initial SES at low. 
So right here at our first time step, it's, it's um, low here. And over time, it kind of gradually goes to some sort of like equilibrium um, over time. Um, when we um, create our DBNs, so for our first um, slice, Oh, so, so over here we have a temporal index type one, depending on which, um, how far we're jumping ahead into the future here. So for our particular BM, we will have like a temporal index of t equals zero or t equals one. And we specify different CPTs for each of those different um, points in the temporal thing. Now, I want you to have a play around with this. So this is a, a Gini exercise. It's got a kind of fun one um, with a population dynamics between grass and cows. So we have like a, a fluctuating population. When the grass population blooms, the cow population comes in and eats and they have a population explosion. They eat all the grass and then the cows all die off and then the grass grows back again. So now people, people who got Genie installed on their machine, hands up. Okay, so people who didn't get um, Genie on the machine, do you want to just come over and um, double up with somebody else? And if we go to the back of the book and go to um, exercise 18, so, <laughs> So when we, when we first designed our court, Net, course, Netica was like the good go-to tool which had a nice easy usability friend, um, interface. Genie has since then become really awesome and is kind of nifty and very pretty. I, th I think, do you find that this one's a bit nicer to work with than um, Netica? Um, and it's got a lot of cool functionality and it was free for a while, developed by the University of uh, Pittsburgh and um, Marek who might be involved, I don't know, anyway. Um, uh, and then recently Marek decided to actually try to monetize it and he's turned it into some um, needs license type stuff. So it's all free for academic use, which is fine for you guys, but it, that kind of deters us from actually using it for the training course. But I do actually think this is nice. There's a lot of cool nifty features in it, but it's not very well documented as well. So there's a bit of kind of hacking around and trying to work out stuff. So um, it seems like most people got most of this B in here. There's a few catches to get it working, but it's kind of nice. Um, uh, so, so the way that we interpret this is we can see that for the, the top bar in grass that our, um, we start off with a high, our probability of um, high grass is at one. Um, we've got a certainty of high grass and a, um, a certainty of uh, no, no low grass. And then over the time, those bars get flat over time. Can you think about what's actually going on with that? Why those, that, the, the fluctuations is dampening over time? Most people will think that it's kind of because of the fluctuations, that the uh, fluctuations, the population are dampening over time, but it's actually because the uncertainty is increasing over time. As we go over time, uh, we, uh, we get more to a sort of flat distribution. We just don't know where we are in the cyclic distribution. I've actually designed it so they're con going to constantly be fluctuating up and down forever. It's just there's going to be a slow uncertainty increasing over time. Um, did you guys work out, you worked out evidence? So I can put in evidence at different points anywhere in the distribution. So I can put in an evidence at some time on um, the seventh time step. So I say it's high there. Um, this disappears here because the update immediately is off. Did you guys work out that? And somewhere in the seventh here, I've got this kind of weird distribution type thing. So it's doing propagating evidence um, backwards in time from that seventh step and forwards from the seventh step as well. So we've got this kind of nifty thing here. Somebody asked me about the little corner icon here. This little, um, I think it's like an anchor earthing symbol, is um, that tells me that there's some evidence that's been entered into that node. And the tick here is telling me that it's been updated. So it's currently up to date to represent what evidence is in the Bayesian network. Uh, there's a couple of other little tricks in here. If I go to the value here, you can actually see what the, the actual numbers for each of the time steps there, and you get a, a different visualization of this. And I think there's a few different things to play with here on how you might actually visualize that. So there's lots of nifty stuff in Genie. You just got to play around and try to find it. Um, I, I, I would say that I doubt there's actually any documentation that's telling you exactly what's going on here, but I can work out that there's some sort of like, this is just showing the numbers there on this bar here. This is a visualization that we play with already. So, um, and because I put that evidence in there, you can see at time steps um, seven where I put in that 
um, made the grass high that's entered in this um, value box here. Um, and there's a couple of other property things here which Stephen will probably go into about the definition thing. Um, some other kind of cool visualization stuff. Um, using like pie charts and um, bar charts and stuff like that, which can be useful for um, eliciting from experts as well. So Jeannie has all these tools. I don't know if Stephen's actually going to demonstrate that, but he will talk about these techniques for um, eliciting probabilities from experts and doing something that's not just asking them for a, a number. Anybody else have any questions or comments that didn't make sense or observations about the Jeannie? So I'm kind of doing most of my modelling in Genie nowadays, but I jump between Genie and, um, and Netica and Hugen, depending on the projects and what I need to do with it. Um, Genie's just got a nice interface, and well, part of my stuff is if I can show people a pretty BN, that really works. It's <laughs> like that. <laughs> so um, that's, that's really valuable for that um, aspect. Um, and I've... Uh, Eric, yep. can you shift my finger back over to the PowerPoint? Where is Just down the bottom. Okay. The PowerPoint. No, that one. Yeah, okay. And full screen it for us. I usually just go down. Yeah, it's the little icon to the bottom right hand next to the. Oh, okay. Oh, I've got my uh, FX probably not going to work. <laughs> so it's the right hand bottom. Yeah. Next one. No, other way. That one. No, the back. That one. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so we did that. Okay, so um, yeah, that's our summary. We can we, we can do Bayesian networks to um, do this um, thing over, over time, and it is something that I actually apply a fair bit. Um, uh, my observation is that you know using um, Netica and Genie for their support with this stuff is kind of nifty, and it's good to create toy BNs. But when we start creating really big, complicated Bayesian networks, I usually go to um, my application programming interface to actually support the designing of those, building of those Bayesian networks. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and then a lot of you guys are going to be using the API, is that right? Yeah. 